Hello, and thank you for joining me here on Bright Talk to talk about the fastest way to destroy employee morale and engagement. The quote you see on screen, that's what any supervisor, manager, uh, business partner, or senior leader ought to be aiming for. The impact on workplace culture would be incredible if people were three times more motivated and more committed than they are today. And the impact on productivity, well, um, that would be very, very impressive, too, if people were exerting more energy and dedicating more of their talents to the organization. And then the, the domino effect. That's what we'd love to see, that, that the improved morale, the engagement, the productivity, with all that, um, we'd, we'd expect higher levels of employee satisfaction and retention, which means our expenses on recruiting, Hiring and onboarding would be reduced, and the time spent saved could be spent on other work. Okay, but not only that, we'd trim expenses elsewhere too because presumably right, these committed employees, they'd, they'd make fewer mistakes, there'd be less rework, higher productivity yields would cut over time and help us save in, in a myriad of other ways. More work would be done more quickly, and as a result, of improved quality and faster turnaround, customers would be satisfied too, and, and the customer experience itself would be improved by happier employees. So ultimately, the bottom line impact would be positive, highly positive according to research that explains everything I've just said in, in much greater depth. Um, so if you, if you would like to learn more about that research, because that's not what I'll be talking about today, but if you would like more about that, please check out our other webinars I've recorded for this channel. And notice the first resource in your Attachments tab, the data and the how-to information about engagement make for a really good follow-up to today's topic. But today, today we're going to be looking through a, a, a different lens. Before we talk about the fastest way to destroy employee morale and engagement, let me properly introduce myself. My name is Deb Calvert, and I'm the author of the bestseller Discover Questions, Get You Connected, and of the award-winning blogs Connect to Lead, Connect to Win, and Connect to Sell. And based on that sentence alone, maybe you've guessed that uh, connections are very important to me. So I would be honored if, if you'd connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Google+. My handle is, is there on screen along with my email address. My company is People First Productivity Solutions. We build organizational strength by putting people first. And I work as an executive coach, a meeting facilitator, a trainer, and consultant to help people improve their, their connections and to help organizations improve their people practices. High engagement and morale are indicators of a truly people first environment. Uh, background, I've, I've been a corporate HR director, and I've worked with many HR, L&D, and OD professionals since opening my company in 2006. And as a speaker, I know that today's topic has universal appeal to people in a, in a wide variety of roles. Okay, a little bit about logistics. If you're new to Bright Talk, um, please do notice the features. I, I mentioned the Attachments tab. It's in the upper left corner of your screen, and I've included several bonus resources for you there. Um, I'll mention them as, as we're going, and there will be some other information to come, too. I'll be pointing you to other webinars that are here on the Bright Talk channel, and you can subscribe to this channel and get more content every month if you'd like to. Bright Talk makes it so easy to stay on top of what's new and what's relevant specifically for you. Okay, now enough of that setup. Let's get back to the business at hand because you came to hear about the fastest way to destroy employee morale and engagement. So let's get right back to that. I think the reason that we need to talk about this is that there's a problem. It's a growing problem, and it's a problem that manifests in a variety of ways, including what you see there on screen, some shockingly low levels of employee engagement. And the impact, of course, of low engagement, it's what we talked about as we were opening. Low engagement means 
reduced job satisfaction, reduced retention, reduced productivity, low levels of production, measurable impacts including suboptimum output levels and, and reduced quality and, and poor customer satisfaction levels. Um, inside it looks like resistance to change and you see increased expenses and ultimately that, that means that inability to compete and profit at levels you'd otherwise be enjoying. But the big mystery seems to be how. How do we engage employees? How do we boost levels of employee engagement? What do we have to do to get all these obvious and well-documented benefits of employee engagement? So I'd, I'd like to take a look at some research that answers these questions, starting with this 2015 study from CultureAmp. They conducted focus groups with employees at, at dozens of companies, and they found something very interesting. They found that if you're looking to build morale, which of course is linked to engagement, that there are some drivers, and six of them that I'd like to call out today, six noteworthy drivers, all six of these rank above pay and above work-life balance as things that will boost the level of workplace morale. Now, I've taken those six things, and I've, and I've grouped them here for us into two themes. The first one you see now is how, how the manager views the work, the employees, and the future. T to build morale, managers must give people a reason to be confident in them, the manager, and also in the company. And on top of that, managers have to show that, that they are confident in, they believe in the individual employee. They have to show some trust. They have to provide some opportunities to that employee. And managers need to share a vision. It needs to be a vision that's relevant and inspiring to me, to, to the individual person, not, not just to the group, not just to the stakeholders, but to the individual employee, each and every one of them. The second theme is related to what the company offers. That was about the managers, what, what the company offers, and how that, that offering is conveyed to the employees. So the company needs to make it very clear that there are good career prospects. And, and those career prospects are, are clear. The pathway to them is evident to everybody. It's not mysterious. And, and that career path seems achievable. It's broken down into little manageable chunks, steps. So I know what to do if I am to proceed in my career growth or in my personal development. The company also needs to be allowing me, no matter what my job level, no matter how new I might be to the organization, people want to know that they're making a meaningful contribution. And then, because it is about the individual, that there's also a need for the company to allow access to opportunities for learning and development, but, but just not any learning and development. It can't be canned courses and requisite next steps. Those are have a purpose, but it also has to be made highly appealing to the individual. Perhaps there even needs to be some customization to match the individual interest and needs of the individual. Now, we'll talk about how to do all these things, so don't let this be overwhelming at this point, but, but these six factors, they pertain to how the employee feels that they are going to be engaged with and what their morale is going to be sustained like within the organization. Just to sum those up so you see them all together, people want to know that they can be confident in the person they report to and confident in the company that they work for. And they want to feel supported. They want people to show faith in them. They also want there to be an inspiring vision that's appealing at the individual level their career paths are evident and achievable. They can contribute, and there are ways to learn and grow, and those are appealing ways. And if we add all of this up, at least in my way of looking at it, one important thing that every single manager should be thinking about is this. How? How do I do more so that I am ennobling others? 
And that word ennoblement, well, it means to make someone feel important, to help them to feel worthy, to let them know that you view them in some way as being excellent in their own right. The closest synonym that I can find for ennoblement is to dignify. And yes, that's a more familiar word, but it's it's not one that everybody would define in the same way. Um, actually, dignity or to dignify someone, it has a lot of interpretations. And and if you'd like to to see more about that, there are 30 different perspectives that we collected at People First Productivity Solutions, 30 stories from around the world about how people felt dignified in their work. Um, take a look on our website at the Connect to Lead blog if you'd like to read those, those stories from 30 bloggers and, and how they all rolled up. The, the main thing to, to note as you read that, though, is that there was so little similarity from one story to the next. Dignity is highly personalized. Okay, but, but the word ennoblement, it can help us out here. It's a little bit more specific in exactly what it means. It's just, it's just as simple as making people feel important. And there's a lot of research. So we, we not only have this word, but we have this research that can help us focus our attention in the workplace when it comes to ennobling others. The reason this matters so much is that the number one way to destroy employee morale and engagement is to fail at ennobling people. And these phrases that you see on screen, they might seem a little bit extreme. You may be feeling and thinking as soon as you see these that there's some defensiveness because, of course, you would never do these things. And, and maybe you're even a little bit offended that I would go to this extreme. So let me say first and foremost, I, I don't think people do these things on purpose. But I do think there are a lot of inadvertent behaviors that cause people to feel this way. So I'd like to ask you to pause and consider a few things, a few things that may have been done totally inadvertently, without malintent, and just reflect on these. Has your company or any manager in your company or anybody you've ever worked for ever done something like this? just for the, the purposes maybe of expediency or because there's a certain group who are in the know and they meet behind closed doors. Or maybe because there's a high level of secrecy and a, and a hierarchical structure that implies information hoarding is a, is a privilege and a power. Or maybe there's top-down decision-making because it would just take too long to get everyone's input. And after all, they're so inexperienced that they wouldn't add much value to the discussion anyway. Hmm. Whatever the reason might be for decision-making that's not inclusive, perhaps there's a, a lack of awareness that this top-down decision-making is compromising the decision quality and, and reducing the level of buy-in or commitment to the decisions being made. And not only that, the perception of those who are excluded, no matter how valid your reasons are for excluding them, their perceptions could be that you see them as being of a lower status. And this, of course, can feel like belittling or like an indignity. Or maybe, completely inadvertently and without realizing how this would be perceived, Maybe this has happened in your organization. Managers are, are tasked with getting work done through others. And when others have a job to do, sometimes the job and its output do seem like the, the sole focus. We even call people by their job role, and we think of them in terms of their function. For example, in a, in a sales organization, you always hear phrases like hunters and farmers and people who work inside are now the SDRs. And they may hand work off to field sales. And then there's the, um, the top producer or the closers. But in any workplace, we use terms like those to describe job functions or outcomes. And anytime that's happening, there's a certain 
uh, depersonalization that, that comes with that practice. Now, if you throw in a pressure-driven focus on results, and you might have work, work performance, and more work as the only three things you ever talk about with your employees. But people who feel valued only for their work or their work product and, and aren't feeling valued for their ideas and their background and their personality and their interests, well, they may begin to feel like their full worth isn't appreciated. They may not feel dignified or respected. Now, let me just put up a few more examples on screen of, of some other ways that people may feel less than ennobled in their work. I don't think that these things are done intentionally to demoralize or disengage employees. I think these happen because managers, and I do mean all managers, I mean CEOs and the executive suite, uh, the HR managers and business partners, the frontline supervisors in every department, the directors, I mean all of them. We are all pulled in so many directions. And maybe folks just aren't taking the time to, to think about how their actions might be perceived and, and interpreted. Now, these things, th this whole notion of ennoblement, it's not the stuff you generally see taught, at least not explicitly taught, in supervisory skills courses. And sometimes these are the sort of things that people dismiss as, oh, merely generational differences. Or these are the perceptions that are hinted at in employee engagement surveys, but never taken seriously enough to do something about. So they fester, and they insidiously take root by the way, when people try to point out these issues and the issues are ignored or dismissed, well, that exacerbates the problem. That, too, makes people feel the opposite of ennobled. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to take these one by one and see how can we can replace some of these inadvertent behaviors with simple replacement behaviors that will ennoble people and will help them to feel more engaged. Because remember, the benefits of doing this are significant. So instead of top-down decision-making, we could take a look at, at being more inclusive. But, but let me point out that inclusion in decision-making does not have to mean a narrow interpretation like um, everyone gets a vote. That democratic process, it's, it's certainly one option. And it, it might be suitable for decisions that, that don't require a high degree of expertise or uh, decisions that are relatively inconsequential. But there are lots of other options for being more inclusive. What I've put on screen here, these are some ways that are about including people in a variety of roles other than the role of final decision maker. See, some of your team members, they might be really good at analyzing and, and pinpointing the real problems that need to be solved. And then maybe you've got some people who would be good information gatherers. And, and they can be involved by talking to a variety of other people who see the situation from various perspectives. And then you've got some people who can contribute ideas and stir up some questions. Maybe they can participate in brainstorming sessions just to generate and get out on the table lots of ideas. Others, you know who they are. They're probably already very good at this. They can play devil's advocate. They can raise the issues and the alternative perspectives and poke the holes in the decisions that are already being considered. Maybe you have some people who could be involved as criteria makers. They, they set the criteria that any final decisions would be evaluated against. And, and you might even need decision champions. This would be the, the, the group that shares the final decision with others and educates people about the changes that might be associated with that decision. Your aim is, is simply to engage people in the process of decision making in ways that they can actually contribute to the process even if not to the final decision. And, and this is not meant to be busy work. What I'm describing 
it, it only works when you genuinely see the value in inclusivity. But just imagine how the quality of your decisions could improve if you had people doing this kind of work as part of the decision-making process. And imagine, too, the way people would respond to decisions when they've been ennobled as those decisions are taking shape versus being left out of decisions that affect them. Here's another way to look at this. What I've put on screen is used in a lot of public policy decision-making. And what they do there is they split in half the decision-making group. 50% of the people involved in that decision-making process, they've been involved, they've participated in prior processes related to this one, but the other half, they're newcomers. They have not been involved. And then when the policy-making effort is taking place, what this, this setup has done is it acknowledges that the past conversations have merit and those decisions that have laid the path to this point need to be understood, but we also always need new ideas, and those new ideas may alter the way that we're thinking at this point going forward. This kind of an inclusivity in your decision-making, the, the mixing it up regarding who's at the table, it operates on, on this principle. The principle is that both process and outcome are important. And your process of decision-making has an effect on people. And it has an effect on the way the team will work together and on the culture of the workplace and, and so much more. So perhaps some of these impacts of the process are just as important as the actual decision being made. And of course there's value then in the ideas that newcomers can bring. And there's value in dissension that prevents groupthink. And, and there's value in seeking out the diversity of thought and to taking time to hear input from everyone who's affected by a decision. So inclusivity, the mindset of inclusivity, that's one of the first ways that you can ennoble people and avoid making them feel disenfranchised or, or reducing their morale. If you're interested, by the way, in learning more about decision-making and, and how you can make higher quality decisions and be more inclusive, there are some other ideas uh, in the attachment section. I've included an infographic for you. But that's one of seven. We're going to look at all seven of these. So let me move to the second one. Instead of people feeling like a cog in the wheel, maybe we can help understand what makes those people tick. Because is there anything worse than feeling like your boss doesn't even know you? And on the extreme, I've been in workplaces where a manager can barely remember the names of people on his staff. One called his assistant by the name of an admin who left more than two years prior. Another refused to learn the names of people on the production line because, in his own words, uh, well, they just come and go so fast anyway, to which I could only respond, yeah, I, I wonder why. But there are less extreme examples out there, and, and it's really not that uncommon to encounter a director who doesn't know the names of all the people reporting to his or her management team. Those numbers are usually far less than 100. So if a high school teacher can do it for the 200 or so students who enter his or her classroom each semester, why can't we do the same to personalize our connections in the workplace? And in fact, it ought to go beyond names. Every individual on a team has his or her own unique set of values and motivations. The business case for knowing what motivates people should be pretty obvious, but it does require a little time and the willingness to pay attention to people. Let me give you one other story. It's, it's kind of comical, but it's been going on for years, and as we're beginning to enter the holiday season, I heard about it again. Um, this is a friend of mine. Her name is Mary. She's been working at the same company for 12 or 13 years for the same boss, and he's pretty proud of himself because what he does at the beginning of each month, without fail, he goes to Starbucks, 
and he buys a lot of $5, $10 gift cards at Starbucks. And he's really proud of himself for the way that he consistently recognizes and rewards people by handing out these Starbucks cards every time they, they do something that he's pleased with. So he's generous. He's got some right ideas there. But here's the problem. Mary, having worked for him all these years, collects Starbucks gift cards throughout the year, and she uses them to give in turn during the holidays to people who she thinks will actually value and use the cards because Mary doesn't drink hot beverages, doesn't eat sweets. For religious and other reasons, she has a very strict diet, and she would never dream of going to that particular store, Starbucks. Her boss hasn't figured this out in all this time. He hasn't taken the time to notice. Well, we're all like Mary. Not only do individuals want to be known for who they are and what makes them tick, they want an opportunity to contribute. But how can they get that opportunity if no one knows about their hidden talents and their background and their interests that expand beyond their current job duties? And what about their preferences? Do managers take the time to consider individual preferences? Or does it look like it's just the manager's preferences that matter most? Or is getting to the level of preferences just too much trouble versus sticking to the job requirements and nothing more? People are telling us they want to be known. They want to feel they belong because they're known and because they're accepted And when they feel that way, they become more engaged and they apply additional discretionary effort to their work, and many cascading benefits come from that feeling of belonging. So here are some ways to dignify individuals in your workplace. None of these involve extra work, only a a paradigm shift. The new paradigm starts with the belief that every single person has something to contribute that goes beyond getting today's work done. Perhaps there are some process improvements that people on the front line and only on the front line can recognize. Uh, Maybe there's status quo thinking that the newest member of your team could challenge if he or she felt comfortable doing so. And you know those, those dumb questions that new hires ask? Those are often very helpful in spotlighting erroneous thinking or outdated practices or other problems, but they won't ask why if they feel that their questions are supposed to be filtered. And the same is true for longer-term employees, too. So as we're working to dignify individuals, we need to think about how we can build in some activities, even some team-building workshops, perhaps, that that do values card sorts and, and that get people to know each other better. And we need to be on the lookout, consciously observing the hidden talents or asking the questions that will bring them to the surface. And then it it sounds so simple. It gets lost in the hectic, frenzied, busy work that we all do. But instead of that, to be able to pause even momentarily throughout the day and pay attention to what matters to people because that's how we dignify them. Now, this is number three. Out of the seven ways that you and others in your organization may inadvertently be eroding ennoblement, this one happens because managers really are very, very busy. But I think it sometimes happens when managers or directors begin to see themselves and their work as more important than the work of the people or even than the people who report to them. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've seen a manager cancel a one-to-one meeting with an employee because something more important popped up. The kinds of things that get classified as more important, well, a backlog of reports, um, a customer issue, getting called into a meeting with senior management, a whole host of things that may seem urgent. But really, is there anything more important than the people in your organization The people who report to you and are responsible for the deliverables that will make you look good? I know that to employees, there's nothing more important than a meeting with the boss. And if it's something big like um, an annual performance review, 
You better believe that they've thought about it, planned for it. They might even have dressed up a little bit for it. And every time a manager takes that time with an employee for granted and reschedules or cancels that meeting, it sends a strong signal. Although when intended, that signal is that the employee really isn't all that important after all, that the manager is more important and too busy to be bothered. And that big buildup for the meeting, it comes crashing down. It's a big letdown. Just as bad as chronically rescheduling or canceling employee meetings is holding them but allowing disruptions and distractions during them. Your employees, they do deserve your full attention. And it's not respectful to treat people in a way that sidelines them. One more way that, that uh, managers make allowances for themselves is by failing to follow through on promises they make. To a manager, this might seem like just a little oversight when there's that gap in follow through. Saying things like, uh, let me get back to you tomorrow, or I'll check on that, or uh, let's meet this afternoon, those are, those are nothing less than promises. And not following through is breaking a promise. But when you do follow through, two things happen simultaneously. First, you dignify others. You convey that the person mattered enough to you for you to keep the promise you made. And second, you boost and maintain your own credibility. For people who want to lead others, credibility is the, the bedrock of success. Credibility is measured behaviorally by this one thing. It's the WYSIWYG. DeWYSIWYG, that stands for do what you say you will do. And if you will do what you say you will do, people will feel dignified and they will see you as being a credible leader. If you want to know more about DeWYSIWYG, hey, come on to our website, peoplefirstps.com. Go to our YouTube channel. It's also there. These are little videos we do. They're one-minute leadership videos, and DeWYSIWYG is one of them. It's really important. Well, the replacement behaviors that will help you connect with people in ennobling ways and will help you boost your own effectiveness are super simple. Do WYSIWYG, keep your meetings with people who report to you, and be fully present when you spend time with your employees. And these are all very simple choices, choices that any of us are capable of making without any additional training or knowledge, but they involve breaking bad habits and shifting the way we prioritize. What you see now on screen, these are the, the considerations to weigh before rejecting the use of these replacement behaviors. As you're breaking old habits and developing new ones to ennoble people, let these considerations urge you forward. And be very careful. Instead of shutting people down, you want to be opening people up. Cornell professor James Dietert, um, he specializes in uh, transparent communication in the workplace. He wrote a great article in Harvard Business Review that describes exactly why it is that people hold back in the workplace. And the five reasons he listed there on screen there, um, he, he listed those five reasons, and, and they have a lot to do with the way a manager has responded in the past. Because once people feel shut down, they'll be very reluctant to speak up again. But, but none of this, none of these things set up a, a situation where people can feel ennobled. Some of these even become downright degrading. And when I look at this list, I think of Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo the, the recent debacle there, because people who kept doing things they knew were unethical, they did that because they didn't feel they could speak up and people who did speak up were fired, and people who waited for others to speak up because somehow it, it might be heard or it might be accepted as more appropriate if it came from someone else, well, that situation became much bigger than it had to be much longer term. It's really unfortunate that people felt so shut down. No one, none of us, we don't want to create that kind of climate but it doesn't happen overnight. It happens little by little as minor shutdowns of employees occur over and over again. Busy managers don't mean to shut people down, and usually they feel just awful when they realize that's what they've done. 
but what we need are some replacement behaviors that will draw people out. We want to be sure that people know that they can come to us and that they'll be taken seriously. You want to encourage people to, to bring problems and questions to you. And sure, sometimes what they bring to you will be a, a bit of a nuisance, and sometimes their ideas will be a little misguided. But better they bring those to you than, than not open them up and, and feel shut down. And better they bring them to you so you have an opportunity to educate folks and to show them different ways of looking at the situation. You want people to speak freely, so you need to show that there is value to you, value that you place on their courage to speak freely. And, and if you want some help, if you need a resource to get employees to think differently about speaking openly, look at your culture, look at the kinds of messages that have been inadvertently put out there. And if you like, you can use a webinar that's right here on this channel about bringing all voices in. This one's for frontline employees to feel like they can use their voice more assertively. Now, I know I'm out of step on this one. But I have to tell you that I'm not a fan of the subjective nine-box model and the ratings of employees based on potential and performance. Frankly, I think these ratings are a reflection of the manager doing the rating more than the individuals being rated. In most organizations, people know who the hypos are, and being high potential means you, you get more opportunities for development and you get more grace when you take risks and fail forward. But you know, the popos see this as favoritism. Yeah, popos. Because if you're not hypo, you're popo. That's passed over and pissed off. Popos feel belittled and marginalized. They're not getting as much from the employer. So why should they give as much as they otherwise might? They seldom understand why they aren't hypo too. And they have no idea how to change that perception once they're placed in some little box that does not say high performance and high potential. And is it any wonder they feel this way? This entire process has so little transparency, and according to research, very little accuracy or efficacy either. A study by Jean Martin and Conrad Schmidt found that over 40% of internal promotions given to hypos end in failure. And companies don't seem to, to do much to review their own programs, and they don't look outside the performance appraisal and the manager opinion for these classifications to begin with. Not to mention that the notion of potential, it's extremely elusive. How, how can any one person gauge another person's potential to develop so they can succeed in a job that neither of them has ever even done? So what if? What if you could invest your talent development dollars in a way that created a learning culture for everyone? Then perhaps you could see who is accessing the learning opportunities. The development and drive for it would more naturally reveal the potential of individuals. In essence, they'd be self-selecting into the high potential ranking. Let me breeze through some ways you could do that. Get in touch with me if you want more information. These are only 10 ways. Our list could be much, much longer. But as we look at these, as they're, they're changing on screen, be thinking about in your organization, what are some free, fast, easy ways organic ways, inexpensive ways that you could be creating a learning culture that gives access to every single person, regardless of job title and function, regardless of how they've been evaluated, everybody can access learning and growth. And instead of there being an inner circle, you'd expand that circle. People inside the organization would be teaching each other. You'd tear down the hierarchy. You'd move away from peers level access only. You'd get people outside of their silos and their cliques. You'd get executives mingling out and about with people in all parts of the company. Maybe you'd even make it their job to learn something new from someone new every day. That's right, executives learning from people at other levels of the organization. You'd teach them to ask questions and gather information, and you'd help them see the value of talking to the people who are on the front line. You would be showing them how to, ennobling other, how to ennoble others and, and teaching them why this matters so much. A few additional tips. These are tips that would allow that access. They would, they would break down the inner circle. They'd create a sense of belonging. They'd constantly demonstrate that 
at this company, we're all in this together. You'd be building business acumen. By the way, what I'm talking about right now, it, it does require a certain degree of humility and the belief that the strongest leaders build other leaders. Well, last but not least, instead of limited communication, because you know the problem with limited communication is that people fill in the gaps. They make stuff up when they don't have all the information. So whatever the most important messages are, take Patrick Lencioni's advice in the advantage. That advice is to maintain control of your message, not by hoarding it, not by withholding information, but by sharing it in the way you want it to be shared. You do that by being the communicator of your message. What you would be doing is using some replacement behaviors that ennoble people through communication. And don't worry, you're not going to sound like a broken record. You're going to be sounding like someone who cares enough to impart what people need to know so that they can feel plugged in, so that they can be a part of things, so that they can see what's transpiring in live time and not having some big sweeping surprise coming at them later. You would be describing to them, here's the situation, here's the impact on you, and here are the actions that we're taking and that you need to take going forward. You would be talking to people in a way that, that they feel included. When you do all of these things, when you begin to use these replacement behaviors and you make a deliberate choice to ennoble people, it will lead to higher levels of morale and engagement in your organization. And don't forget, engagement leads to all those benefits that, that research tells us are ours just for the unlocking of the engagement. Improved retention, higher levels of productivity, better levels of customer satisfaction, more top-line revenue, more bottom-line profit. That research uh, comes from a variety of sources. The research from Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner prove that there are 30 behaviors, very specific ennobling behaviors, that significantly increase employee engagement. And, yeah, there's another webinar on this channel that goes into more detail about that. But what we're talking about, in essence, is leadership. Leaders at every level, managers, supervisors, people who influence others, they need to be able to do the things we've discussed here, to inspire confidence, to show faith in employees, to communicate that inspiring vision, to show how the career path lays out and what you need to do to get on that path, to make a contribution at, at every level, to be, be getting access to learning and development. If you're interested in, in all of this and, and in, in developing your leaders so that this can happen, perhaps we can help. We're people-first productivity solutions, and we build organizational strength by putting people first. We offer a lot of free resources and tools. Some are here. Many more are on our website. That's peoplefirstps.com. We release exclusive new ones to the Connect community every four to six weeks, so be sure to subscribe. There's a link in the attachments. One thing that you'll see there in that link is that you can also sign up or sign other people in your organization up for a free training course for emerging leaders. And we can help you build your own program or bring in one like my own personal favorite, the gold standard known as the Leadership Challenge, which is backed by 30 years of academic and workplace research. Whatever you decide to do, big or small, be sure to focus on ennobling your employees because inadvertently failing to ennoble them is the fastest way to destroy morale and diminish engagement. Don't let that happen in your organization. We've run out of time, but I welcome your input and your questions. Please take advantage of the resources that we've made available for you here and let us know if we can help you in any other way Thank you so much for being with us here today.